My name is Ella Wakatama. My preferred titles are mummy, auntie, daughter or babe. One, the ground beneath my feet. 1980 was the year Rhodesia became Zimbabwe. There was a short period when the country was named Zimbabwe Rhodesia in a clumsy and politically cynical attempt at a soft option towards majority rule. But no one I knew took that seriously. So, 1980. It was a huge year. Bob Marley came to sing every man got a right to decide his own destiny. His reggae rhythms and optimistic philosophizing escorting us towards self-governance in our own promised land. 1980 was also the year I started my secondary school education at Arundel School in Mount Pleasant, Harare. Established in 1955, the school had an almost mythical reputation in the country. The high security pink prison, all girls school on 100 glorious acres, complete with swimming pool, rolling lawns, a lake, and all the games courts needed to ensure the daughters of the country's elite were as fit in body as they were agile in mind. I had spent the previous year of primary school determined that I would attend Arundel, knowing I would need to get an academic bursary to offset the fees. My mother, ever pragmatic, ever uncompromising, had met my proclaimed ambition with, well then, you'll need to get a scholarship. That's the scene set. Imagine gaggles of African girls in their brown skirts and turquoise blouses in the temperate Southern African heat of a January summer. Tensions were running high because my cohort started the school, coincided with elections, the first allowing for one man and one woman, one vote, with the majority population of black Zimbabweans going to the polls for the first time. Along with the jubilation and hope that so many held, there was also the palpable tension and fear felt by the remaining white settler citizens. I feel sick. <laughs> That's all I can say. Are you going to stay in Rhodesia? I don't think so. Well, I am frightened because um, I feel we've lost the war. We've been fighting for it and all the things that everybody has fought for has gone. We've lost it. Those African girls, I'd asked you to imagine, were at a ratio of about 10 to 1, predominantly white. Those of us who were indigenous had always been accepted to Arundel, but always in a manageable minority. That year was the year I met Kerry Jane Guttridge. Younger than most of the other largely female teachers, dressed in flowy white boho dresses and sandals, with hair that I remember being dyed a particular kind of red that does not occur in nature. She trailed what was to the hugely impressionable and over-imaginative girl I was then, a heady and exotic fragrance of patchouli. For a child whose main activity, hobby, and pastime was reading books, inhaling a novel a day with ease, even when it meant hiding the book under my desk while I pretended to pay attention in Afrikaans classes, Kerry Jane was an English teacher sent from the heavens just for me. She was the first person to call me out for only doing my second best with homework that interfered with whatever was my current fictional obsession. You don't fool me with those big brown eyes, Ella Wakatama. And I thought, big brown eyes, that's nice. And set about trying to impress her, probably for the rest of my life. And I was thinking about the women not only in my life, but the women I've read, because so much of my life is about reading and the books that I've read, thinking about the women who exemplify that and thinking that if I am a free thinker, if I, when I'm at my bravest, um, what is it that allows me to do that? Like, you know, what have I learned? What do I know that allows me to um, go out and do the things that I want to do or speak out about things that I think are important? So I chose, um, first of all, an English teacher. And I think that anyone who loves books has an English teacher who is kind of like a guardian angel. So I chose Kerry Jane Guttridge, who was the first English teacher who I sort of remember. I remember everything about her. Miss Guttridge never, ever miss. 
assigned us The Grass is Singing by Doris Lessing as one of our class texts. It was life-changing. I knew that Africans, that black people, wrote books. My father had a decent library in his office, so I had read key texts from the Heinemann African Writer series, but none of those books were set on the ground beneath my own feet. Lessing's was, and it was shocking and transgressive. It may have been right to question that the sheltered girls of Form 1 were too young for the brutality of the story. A young white woman, Mary Turner, finds herself living a life impoverished in all possible ways on a badly run farm with the husband she cannot abide. And there was the taboo of her interactions with her manservant Moses. Did they? Didn't they? I devoured every word, every sentence of Doris Lessing's 1950 debut. Consider that I had only just graduated from forging permission slips at the local library, aided and abetted by my best friend and fellow criminal Georgina, so we could go into the adult section to check out racy books by Georgette Hare. In The Grass is Singing, the acknowledgement of complicated racial interactions, the idea of a woman breaking societal norms, all of this was as heady as the dense patchouli that overwhelmed senses and ensured one would always know when Kerry Jane had passed along the way. The details of Lessing's protagonist, Mary's disaffection, the uneasy living within a fiercely beautiful landscape, violently settled by an invading force, and at that time, the claimed inheritance of a tribe who would always claim themselves European, even if all the air they had ever breathed was that of Southern Africa. In an interview for the series Web of Stories, Lessing credits the release of Alan Payton's Cry the Beloved Country, published six months before her own book, with paving the way for writing about Southern Africa that gave truth to the lie of happy natives living under colonial rule. Here was a writer who, as her official website summarizes, wrote about the clashes of cultures, the gross injustices of racial inequality, the struggle among opposing elements within an individual's own personality, and the conflict between the individual conscience and the collective good. I could not have formulated it so elegantly then, but it was an interrogation of self and society that answered questions I would not yet known to ask and presented a lifetime's worth of inquiry. And yes, I identified with both author and heroine. But in this story of white misdeed, it was Moses who kept me awake, finishing the book long before our assigned deadline, reading with the torch after lights out had been called in the dorm. Moses, a rural black man working the land that had belonged to his forebears, as a servant, as a girl, I wanted to become a woman who would stand at the vanguard of the battle lines that Lessing had set out. The questions she asked about selfhood and a woman's place in the world, her railing against the strictures of a patriarchal, white, supremacist society, this was the clarion call I heard. But Moses. Moses was the one who was my relative. His was testimony I would have heard from uncles, cousins, in the city, in the village, and working on settler homesteads. And it was a challenge in a newly independent state to navigate between those two. Lessing on the one hand speaking for my gender, and her boldly imagined Moses on the other hand bearing witness to my people's dispossession. It was one of those early reading experiences that lingers forever in the mind, constantly forming and reforming with each reading of the book over time, the questions becoming ever more complicated, even as the answers mutate. It is the hard wiring of the brain that a girl nourished by the superior truth of fiction may not recognize for decades, but it is there. Now, 41 years after Kerry Jane assigned the book, 40-odd years after Heather B's mother complained about the unorthodox new teacher and Kerry Jane mysteriously disappeared from the school. I am not sure of the circumstances, but it seemed clear to those of us who loved her that the very things about her that brought magic and possibility into our lives were a threat to an educational establishment committed to nurturing strong, but certainly not overtly rebellious, young women. It 
must have been, we whispered, that her contract was not renewed in order to preserve the supposed innocence of her young charges. But the damage had, thankfully, already been done. I think it's still the same thing. I think that, you know, we are, we're still in many different societies fighting against patriarchy, you know, and I think that any society that decides that what 51, 52% of the population, whatever we are as women, has to be less, you know, that there's a thing that Toni Morrison says about, you know, if you if you can only stand high or if you can only be great because you're you're kneeling on somebody else or you're pressing somebody else, I'm mangling it, but this is the, the idea, then you have a problem. And I think that, you know, for women all over the world, and certainly for women of color especially, bravery is standing up to that. And it's always at a cost. And even in small acts, like I think my grandmother was really brave, you know, those small little acts. It doesn't have to be on a big world stage. But there's also the bravery, I think, of saying no to life being easy. Because, you know, you, you can, if you take Doris Lessing, for example, she was, you know, living in a, in a settler colony. She could have, you know, um, been a farmer's wife and had a splendid life of, of sort of, you know, um, everything that you want where you, you are deemed to be superior only because of your race. That's, that's easy. Um, what is brave is to say, no, that's not what I want. I've got things to say. That's brave. I can still feel the holding my breath as I turn the page feeling I felt then. I can also still feel the shivers of discomfort on reading Kaffir, a violent and wounding slur to describe people who are my own. And I feel the compressed weight of the knowledge gained now, though not articulated then, that in the pages of Lessing's book was the acknowledgement of the whims and tears of a white woman even in their supposed powerlessness, that can so easily spark tensions that result in annihilation for the man or woman of color, even when the cost to her is self-destruction. In this and other stories set in Southern Africa, Lessing wrote of dispossession, of the theft of land. Her message was uncompromising, brave, and within her own social setting, radical. In 1956, she was proclaimed a prohibited alien in what had been her home and in neighboring South Africa. Lessing went on to write books of feminist politics, books of speculative fiction, books about the family and about the individual within society, books about herself, short stories, and stories about cats and the other essentials of life. In 2007, with the rest of her long life lived away from southern Rhodesia, she was awarded the Nobel Prize in Literature. Lessing's Nobel Lecture was about reading and writing, about the longing for books and knowledge and the inequities of opportunity, juxtaposing visits to impoverished rural schools in Zimbabwe with the visit to a private North London boys' school. It's a lecture that is matter-of-fact, beautifully told, and enhanced by the power of personal observation and experience. Here's what she says about stories. We have a behest of stories, tales from the old storytellers, some of those names we know, but some not. The storytellers go back and back to a clearing in the forest where a great fire burns, and the old shamans dance and sing, for our heritage of stories began in fire, magic, the spirit world, and that is where it is held today. In her setting out of how the telling of tales can both ignite and sustain the human imagination, Lessing is forthright in claiming that without access to books, those sparks, that fire, may never be lit. When my excellent friend at the National Centre for Writing invited me to give a response to the life and legacy of Harriet Martineau, I thought of the impact the words and ideas of women writers have had on my life, on my development as a reader, on the impetus that compels me to seek out that heritage of stories that begin in fire, magic, the spirit world. Stories that sustain, illuminate and challenge. The thing is, I'm Zimbabwean and our families are humongous. I don't mean that people necessarily have lots of babies, which they do, but that, you know, um, my cousins are either my sisters and brothers or they are 
you know, my junior mother or junior father, depending on what the, you know, our family relationships are complex. But the whole idea of it is that you always have family around you. And so, for example, I'll try and explain this really simply because it's important. So a brother and a sister, um, when the brother has children, the, the, the his children call his sister Tete, which is a special kind of aunt. It's the aunt who you first bring your um, intended to see. It's the aunt who you can talk about, about sex and all of those kinds of things. And it's the aunt who protects you when your parents are being unreasonable. Your aunt's children, so your father's sister's children, are your children too. So it means that I have a Mainini, a junior mother, who is only turning 40, I think, next year, or has just turned 40. And her brother is my, my Sekuru, which is sort of, you know, my, my uncle in a fatherly role. Um, it all seems rather complicated, but what it does, and I only realized this in the last 10 years, what it does, it means that I'll never be orphaned. Because even when my parents pass, I will have, you know, my, the, the juniors who are there. And there are lots of other relationships like that. So that's to say that our, my lineage cannot be linear, you know? It's, it's made up of so many different things. And I think for me, that becomes more and more important, that idea of what family means, but also the idea of what my ancestors created as a society in order to make sure that people were looked after. And I think it's something that I've just taken for granted all my life. And now I think of it, you know, when I'm here in London. And my my 40-year-old, my nini, insists on being called a my nini. I can't call her by her first name. And so, you know, in England it translates as aunt, and everyone's kind of like thinking that's very strange. But I'm calling her mother. And my nini is kind of like my own mother. It's like a pet name. And to me, it's become more and more important because, you know, uh, in times of great trouble, I will phone her and she acts like a mother. She'll say, do this, do this, do this. And she cares for me like that. And I have a place of solace, you know. And to me, that's amazing. It takes, you know, it means that I come from a people, I come from a lineage that takes one's um, spiritual and emotional welfare really seriously and um, the difficulty then is how do you then pass that on when you're no longer living in that society when it's a nuclear family it's just you know parents and their children that's not enough it's not enough at all and even in a relationship you know if you're in a long-term partnership or a marriage um, in Zimbabwe you marry the two families marry each other and that's taken very seriously. Two, swallowing the alphabet. Even as I claim Lessing as a mother ancestor, who's hopefully benign, definitely fearsome and exacting, countenance watches over me and other girls and women whose heads have been turned by books. But in that pantheon of departed personal guiding spirits, even as I welcome Lessing's determined challenge, I am always hearing too the voices of my blood relatives, the grandmothers whose lives were so different from the women whose work I am reflecting on today. So let me tell you about the Ella before me, my grandmother. Actually, I'll start with my sister Marvu, who is, as Toni Morrison wrote in Beloved, my best thing. She is also the best storyteller I know. I asked her to remember for me a story about Ambuya, our grandmother, my namesake. Ambuya was an orphan who was partly raised by Methodist missionaries. This was the time of our very own version of apartheid, and there were few opportunities for a young black African orphaned girl. In her late teens, Ambuya found a job as a housemaid, working for a white family in what was then Salisbury in Rhodesia. The gardener on the property was a young man from a village in Marondera, Robson Musarurwa Wakatama, my grandfather. My grandparents had emphatically divergent versions of the story of their coming together. I don't remember Musarurwa's version. He wasn't much one for conversation with little girls. And my grandmother's account was colored by her irascible, sometimes downright acerbic personality. So I'm afraid I don't have a romantic love story for you. What I do have, what my sister remembered for me, is to my mind so much better. 
My sister says she was about four or five. By then, Rhodesia was now Zimbabwe, and I was away at boarding school, inhaling patchouli and being influenced by inappropriate fictions. My family lived in a beautiful house in Tinwald, a former whites-only suburb just outside Harare. Ambuya was visiting. It was probably one of the times she decided our grandfather was taking her for granted, and so she was making her august progress across the country, visiting children and relatives, ignoring messages to come home, until she felt her absence would have been long enough to improve whatever behavior of my grandfather she had disapproved of in the first place. Early in the morning, Ambuya would wake Mavu up in the bed they shared, snuggling her against her ample chest and whispering how much she adored her. It hurt my grandmother to get up in the morning. Her hips hurt and her back hurt, and she walked with a limp, especially when it was cold. But she would ease herself out of bed every school day. She'd run a warm bath for Mavu, put toothpaste on her toothbrush and place it next to the sink, iron out and lay her tiny school uniform and underwear in the order they were to be put on, with the socks pre-folded so her little girl did not have to struggle to pull them up. In the kitchen, she poured cereal and made neat triangle sandwiches with the crust carefully cut off. My sister says she always told Ambuya that if it hurt, she really shouldn't get up. She could stay in bed. My grandmother's response was that she needed to do this. She had been waiting for this for a long time. Back when she was tending to little white children, she said, our aunts and uncles had to get ready in the cold and walk to school without her. She comforted herself with the promise that one day she would have the luxury of making warm baths and pretty sandwiches with her own hands for her own grandchildren. My grandmother's story is the story of many working class women and women of color now and through the ages. She is without doubt one of those Lessing spoke of, a native Zimbabwean denied the education and opportunities that would lift her out of servitude. Eventually, Ambuya went on to leave her job as a housemaid and nanny. She sold vegetables in the market and crocheted tablecloths and doilies, which she also sold. And though you won't find this in every telling of our family history, I know because she told me she also brewed seven days beer and sold that too. All of this industry to ensure her children went to school. She would say of herself, and na angu kujgama bi. I don't have much education or literally I didn't swallow much of the alphabet, but this she could do. She could work, and she did. The swallowing the alphabet is a, um, is a direct translation of, of something that my grandmother had said to my sister, where she says, um, and kuchga is to eat, mabi is like, you know, A, B, E, C, the alphabet. So she's saying, you know, I haven't really um, eaten the alphabet and I changed it to swallow the alphabet. And it's a way of saying, you know, even though I'm not very educated and then she carries on. And now I'm Kuchikama B. And when my sister said that to me, I just wanted to cry because, you know, when I describe reading, I, I describe it as an inhalation. I kind of, I inhale books because, <laughs> because I read fast. I mean, you know, I've been a novel a day person since I could read novels and um, and to me that it's the most important thing my, my daughter will, will attest to that because it's often at the expense of other people <laughs> my sister tells me the story of the folded socks and triangle sandwiches as we sit in a diner in Manhattan we are very far away from my grandmother's market stall and over a long brunch, we tried to imagine what she must have imagined she was working for. She had no way of knowing where swallowing the alphabet would take her descendants or what future awaited them. In the years after my sister tells me the story, I spend endless daydream hours imagining myself swallowing whole libraries of alphabet. One of my favorite people and a beloved friend was Benya Vanga Wainana, the late, um, Kenyan writer and he said to me he'd come to visit London and we'd gone out to breakfast and he'd had a stroke and he had also come out and so there was lots of noise about his coming out um, and I, I asked him how he was and I said Binya how are you doing you know it's been quite a year how you feel how do you feel and he said oh Ella I want to eat the world and I loved 
that I always think of it and to me swallowing the alphabet and eating the world are things that I'm yeah very keen on <laughs> Three, This Mournable Body. Titi Dangarembwa's award-winning debut novel begins with this. I was not sorry when my brother died. I want to have a story detailing when I first read Nervous Conditions, but that particular detail eludes me and I am left with something much more important, how I felt. It is another memory of turning each page as my worldview shifted and new neurons were ignited back in that clearing in the forest where a great fire burns that Lessing tells us is the source of all stories. In the book, the protagonist Tambuzai introduces herself to the reader with this shocking statement. I was not sorry when my brother died. The first point of connection for me was that brother, Tambu's brother is Namu. Both names Job-like in origin, expressing the struggles and privations of the parents who named them. Namo Inesu, sorrow is with us. Tambuzai, to cause suffering. My own brother's name was Namo, and I adored him. Who then was the girl in these pages who could express such a monstrous lack of emotion? Sitsi was writing from my point of view, because as much as I love Doris Lessing, she was a white woman. Um, so her experience was very different to, to mine than could ever have been. And um, Sitsi writes about, not necessarily me specifically, but could have been me. Zimbabwean society was then and still is now incredibly dynamic. Often, the social class by which one may identify oneself is determined solely by the fact that in the previous generation, one child was sent to school and another to the fields. Witness Nangarembwa's heroine growing crops in the hope that her harvest will cover school fees. Can you cook books and feed them to your husband? Stay at home with your mother. Learn to cook and clean. Grow vegetables, her father says. I read Nervous Conditions as the privately educated, plummy-voiced daughter of a father who had sold newspapers by the roadside and then short stories to magazines such as Drum, and later published Shona language novels, which became part of the school curriculum. He gained himself a scholarship at the famed Iowa International Writers Program, and along with my mother, raised his children partly in the United States. My cousin, daughter of my father's sister, speaks with a different accent to mine. And like our grandmother, she sells a miscellany of wares in the market and hustles as a cross-border trader to make her living. She is enterprising, stoically dignified and astute, smart in ways that will never be demanded of me. There, but for the grace of an alphabet swallowed, digested and savored. The author of Nervous Conditions and I share an Arundel experience, although I trailed in years. But more than that, I and many Zimbabwean women of my generation read this, the first novel published by a black Zimbabwean woman, and felt that the author had peeked inside our most secret diaries and written us into being. In the three decades that followed, Nangarembwa would write the story of Tambu through her hard-worn education, her difficulty in finding herself in the capital city of a newly independent country, and a very different world from the village where she had been born, through to her struggle to survive as the promise of independence inexorably decayed through the ruling elite's greed and corruption. Nervous conditions. The Book of Not, and the 2020 Booker Prize shortlisted This Mournable Body. Nangarembwa writes of the psychic trauma of fitting into a world that seems to demand an erasure, a forgetting of the self before, new accent, new clothes, new aspirations. She writes of the daily assaults that we now euphemize as microaggressions, when the impact is always a body blow administered the knowledge that the recipient has no choice but to stand back up and carry on. Um, who are you when you're not surviving but you're thriving, right? And that's the, I think that's why 
racism in all of its forms, if you can ever call it mild or its most violent forms, is so insidious because it's such a distraction from the business of living and actualizing yourself as a human being. You know, you are on the lookout all of the time. I realized then that my body had carried, is carrying all of this tension from a life of being hyper alert. And, you know, I've excelled at it, you know, I think. <laughs> but um, at a cost. And I, I wonder what would happen if we all decided that we weren't going to pay that price anymore. I mean, does it mean, you know, you separate yourself from that society that's doing you so much harm? I mean, it really bothers me that the, the phrase microaggressions, because it's not micro, you know, each one of them is a wound on my body. And so I've been thinking a lot about that and thinking about how I find strength through the, the people that I read, in this case, particularly the women that I read. It becomes a kind of armor. I have to confess, it's also an escape. Um, it also is information. There's that, you know, there's something that you get from finding out about other cultures, finding out. <laughs> My daughter would say knowing your enemies. <laughs> there's, you know, but books give me that information. Sometimes that information is, you know, I was reading um, Victoria Prince Wells in the Palace of Flowers recently, and um, she's writing about black slave, black enslaved Africans in Iran. You know, when it was Persia and, you know, I think it's like 13th century, maybe, maybe a bit later. But to me, that was amazing because then what books give you then is a, we have traveled far. We have always been in these places. So why does it still remain so hard? And, um, you know, the title of Titsu's third book, This Mournable Body, which I think... I can't remember where the original quotation is, but she was inspired by uh, an essay by Teju Cole, who's another writer that I really love. And it's like, you know, this body is worthy of mourning. And if, if that's true, then this body is also worthy of honoring. You know, Tanayasi Coates tells us that the body is the spirit, you know, that what what is held within our black body or the women's body, if that's all we have, and if we're allowing it to be damaged on a daily basis, um, in these societies that we live in. And, and you know, it's not necessarily the fact of being abroad or in diaspora, because sometimes our own homes can do the same thing. And I haven't finished thinking about it. I, I, I don't know, I haven't got a solution or a, a decision. Probably won't be one, but I think the um, consideration and acknowledgement of it, and also the refusal, because I, yeah, I now refuse that no more damage is being done to me. In her unflinching, subtle examination of the impact of colonialization and settlement, in her elucidation of the cost of learning a new language at the expense of a mother's tongue, Dangarembwa writes the story of a girl becoming a woman and of a nation overwhelmed by the inheritance from the former British colonizers of a philosophy of rule based on rapacious greed and the avaricious gathering of resources by the few at the cost of the many. It's bad enough when a country gets colonized, but when the people do as well, that's the end. Really, that's the end, says Nyasha, Tambu's cousin who has grown up in England. Who was this girl? Who is this woman whose body holds the impact of each body blow, whose tongue may yet learn to curse in an acquired language? The answer in the evolution of Tambu in Dangarembwa's decades of writing her story and my own of reading is me. Four, if you can ride the air. Let me read to you from Toni Morrison's Beloved. In this here place we flesh, flesh that weeps, laughs. Flesh that dances on bare feet in grass. Love it, love it hard. Yonder they do not love your flesh. They despise it. They don't love your eyes. They just as soon pick them out. No more do they love the skin on your back. Yonder they flay it, and oh my people, they do not love your hands. Those they only use. Tie, Tie bind, bind, chop, chop off, off and, and leave. leave. 
empty. empty. Love your hands, love them. Raise them up and kiss them. Touch others with them. Pat them together. Stroke them on your face because they don't love that either. You got, you got to, to love, love it, it. You. you. And no, they ain't in love with your mouth. Yonder, out there, they will see it broken and break it again. What you say out of it, they will not heed. What you scream from it, they do not hear. What you put into it to nourish your body, they will snatch away and give you leave-ins instead. No, they don't love your mouth. You You've got, got to, to love it. it. This is flesh I'm talking about here. Flesh that needs to be loved. Feet that need to rest and to dance. Backs that need support. Shoulders that need arms. Strong arms, I'm telling you. And oh, my people, out yonder, hear me. They do not love your neck unnoosed and straight. So I love, love your, your neck. neck. Put a hand on it, grace it, stroke it and hold it up. And, and all, all your, your inside parts that, that they, they just as soon slop for hogs. hogs. You've, You've got, got to love, love them. them. Here again, my sister remembers for me. She reminds me that I am the one who sent her a box full of books. By then, I was an undergrad at a liberal arts college in the American Midwest. And my sister, seven years my junior, was still resident at the Pink Prison. The box contained Michael Shaban's The Mysteries of Pittsburgh, Sassafras, Cypress and Indigo by Ntozake Shange, and The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison. Years later, she would tell me that she was puzzled and outraged with the righteous anger only a girl who is in the throes of defining the woman she will be possesses against the world. That this white guy, Tony Morrison, could write a truth so close to secrets that only belonged to black girls. Because she's a writer who I go back to over and over again and also because she taught me something at a moment in time when I was living in America for the second time in my life. She sort of gives a language to understanding that country, to understanding its original sin in the genocide of the native inhabitants, in the kidnap and enslavement of Africans. You know, it's a country built on blood and rape and plunder. And in Toni Morrison's hands, you get all of the brutality, but you also get all of the fierce, fierce beauty of it. From the receipt of that box of books, a gift that was an effort to fill the miles and miles, the oceans between my baby sister and me, grew a lifelong conversation with Ms. Morrison. We have cried over and again, reading Beloved. We have puzzled our way through Tar Baby. We reveled in the delicious wickedness of Sula and shimmied loose-limbed and inspired through jazz. There was learning here, sure, but there was also the gift of language, sentences that demanded writing down and dissection, committing to memory. But it was only on that trip to Manhattan to celebrate my 50th birthday, the trip in which Marvel told me the story of the folded socks and the triangle sandwiches, that the meaning of all this reading of all Morrison's writing finally came to me. It was 2016 and I was a visiting professor at my alma mater, Goshen College in Indiana. 30 years from my first Midwestern sojourn, the country was nearing the end of the first black president's two-term tenure. I was living in America as an adult, but this country that has been in many ways crucial to the making of me felt more alien than ever before. Marvel, I said, what is it about African Americans that I don't know? This time, at least, I knew the question to ask. I had just visited Cartagena in Colombia as a guest master at the Gabriel Garcia Marquez Foundation. The optics of the visit alone had been upsetting with restaurant meals in which almost all the other diners were white, the waiting staff were brown, and a peek towards the kitchen revealed the dishwashers, who all looked like me. I had called my mother, overwhelmed by the weight any African feels, when she finally sees, actually sees, evidence of the fact that those who were kidnapped, who survived the Middle Passage only to be enslaved, never again returning home. Yes, my mother said, we traveled far. Sister, 
What is it about these people who are us but not us, whose experience of the body blow is just as extreme but so different to our own? What is it I do not know about them? They never stopped fighting, she said. My sister is married to an African-American, a proud black man from a family that claims their African ancestry in every possible aspect of life. You think they acquiesced because that is what the history books want you to believe, but they never stopped fighting. They still are. The story that inspired Morrison's multi-award winning novel, Beloved, was based on that of Margaret Garner, an enslaved woman descendants of kidnapped Africans, who escaped with her husband and children to freedom from Kentucky to Ohio in 1856. When the law officers, antecedents of today's American police force, came to reclaim the escaped property the slaves were said to be, Margaret Garner killed her baby daughter rather than allow her to be taken back into slavery. She had meant to kill all her children, but it was only the two-year-old baby girl that she managed to release into the safety of the afterlife before she was stopped by her captors. It is a story that Morrison tells without holding back from the horror of the act of filicide. It is a story that Morrison develops into the return of that daughter, beloved the embodiment of the sorrows of displacement, the fragmentation of self through generations of surviving the unrelenting brutality of forced servitude. She is our unwilling diaspora made flesh. Listen again to the words of the grandmother and beloved, Baby Sogs. Yonder, out there, they will see it broken and break it again. What you say of it, they will not heed. What you scream from it, they do not hear. As with Lessing's white woman flailing, out of balance and caught in a state of privilege, yet fueled by the will to resist, as with the torturous evolution of a country and a self in Dangarembwa's Tambuzai trilogy, the women in Morrison's work present a truth and a challenge. These stories of complex intersections of resistance, power dynamics, rage and creativity divide the consciousness, taking apart the girl and then the woman reading, giving her the language to put herself together again. None but ourselves can free our mind. My daughters and I have something that we say to each other where you have to know what you don't know. And I think that if you are a woman or a person of color, you're always calibrating um, situations. Like you look to see, is, is this person dangerous? Is this going to be a safe space for me to be? Um, and because you're always calibrating that, you are always therefore asking questions of yourself. And it is part of that like, hypervigilant sort of state that I was talking about earlier on. But to bring it back to the women that I write about, these are all women who were asking really important questions about themselves and about society and articulated in very different ways, but also giving me answers. And so I wanted them to, I wanted to bring them together, but more than that, you know, they, these, these are all chapters of my life as a reader, as a, as a person, as a human being. And there's a kind, there's an intellectual growth there that, um, I think for much of my life I wasn't very serious about it. It was just about inhaling as many stories as I could. But now I'm just trying to pick it apart and find out why those stories were important to me. And, you know, as a publisher, there were stories that weren't there that I needed. And, you know, all of my working life in that respect, the last 20 odd years, have been about finding those stories. Because I know that if they're important to me, they're going to be important to other people as well. Um, and I want other people to have the opportunity to ask themselves questions, to find answers. Five. Let me come back to the woman whose life and work inspired this lecture series and my own contribution today. Harriet Martineau, scholarly spinster, early social theorist who championed the abolition of slavery, essayist, novelist, journalist, 
Hers was a life of learning, thinking and writing at a time when women of her station were to be wives and mothers above all else. I hold an image of her in my mind as this invitation to reflect and respond to the meaning of such a life leads me wandering back to the women whose works have choreographed my own movement through this world. Doris Lessing, the daughter of settlers who turned her back on a certain kind of privilege and dared to imagine the life of my ancestor Moses, one so far removed from her own. Ella, the orphaned girl whose hands were never still and who dared to imagine possibilities even though she could not have known how the story would end. Tsitsidangarembwa, who chronicled the coming of age of a girl called Sorrow and of a nation. Toni Morrison, whose fictions allowed me finally to ask the right question. And while it may be easier in some cases to spot obvious kinship, the magic of the written word, the ecstasy, and the weight of experiencing that primordial dance in the clearing is one that I am grateful to acknowledge. Anne Faderman, in her excellent book about books, Ex Libris, says, Books wrote our life story, and as they accumulated on our shelves and on our windsills and underneath our sofa and on top of our refrigerator, they became chapters in it themselves. What I was trying to do in this essay was to trace my lineage and to think where, where, who are these people who have made me? And also, how does one pass that on? You know, my elder daughter is dyslexic and it wasn't discovered until she was already doing her A-levels. The poor thing had an African mother who just said work harder. And, you know, when I realized she was dyslexic, all kinds of things made sense. But in her adulthood, in her womanhood, she's come to books and, you know, there will be the books she's always heard me talking about. And being able to have those discussions, and you know, my younger daughter is, uh, you know, now at university. That wonderful moment in time where you're discovering all of this thought for the first time, and it's magical. And to me, what's really important is both of them know that what they think is important, that thinking is important, and they know that asking questions is important, which makes them mighty. That's good. Perfect. That's actually a nice way to end. Thank <laughs> you.